Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Well, let's give it a couple of minutes. All right, so I think we can get started. We got a uh, nine people on the call, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, so we got uh, two items on the agenda today. We have uh, Brandon. He's going to talk uh, for I think five minutes about the six security uh, white paper, and then we have Akihiro, and he's going to talk about the current state of uh, rootless containers. <laughs> So I'll pass it on to Brandon. Awesome, thanks, Ricardo. Um, yeah, so so I was just uh, speaking to Ricardo a, a while back, and I, I mentioned to him about the, um, you know, a couple months ago, well, several months ago now, you know, at last Cube we we kind of announced the six security white paper. Um, this was kind of collaborative effort. We had this really nice document. Actually, let me share my screen. Um, okay, there we go. On the button. Uh, bit. Um, so a while back, we kind of released the white paper, right? This was like something um, very conceptual on a high level, covering different aspects of um, um, cognitive security. Um, and, you know, part of that, you know, we, we gathered a lot of good information from the various different groups. Uh, but really what, what this white paper was about um, is kind of touching on concepts, uh, very high level here, very generic recommendations, um, nothing to do with, um, with anything specific. You know, Kubernetes isn't even mentioned uh, within this white paper because it's, it's supposed to be uh, non-biased, really looking at concepts. Um, so for example, if we, if we go into the runtime section, um, which there isn't a link, so I'm going to use the markdown one, which is easy to navigate. Um, oh, sorry. Which we also have this translated in Chinese now, so. <laughs> Um, so you go to runtime environment, you know, we talk about the different phases, uh, you know, how to do compute, what needs to be secure on the orchestration level, uh, protecting resource audit and things like that, but, you know, we don't have like um, specific uh, tooling involved with this. So um, what, the, what we've been recently working on um, to kind of augment uh, the information here is something we call the security, cognitive security map. Um, so the idea here is that, the idea here is that it would be kind of additions to the cognitive security white paper. So you have inf information about uh, the general concepts and then you could click in and you could see the different projects that are related to the different ideas or security um, requirements. And then there would be examples so kind of just to give a quick overview, we, we are currently like curating content for this. Um, so one example here is, you know, for um, security checks and development, we will have a list of projects. So this is kind of like, kind of similar to the landscape. Um, and also we will have examples to kind of help illustrate uh, for someone to, to go in and say, okay, what would a security control within this area look like. Um, and so the examples of what you would do, and these would be very specific to, okay, if you were using a specific technology, what would this look like? Um, they are meant to kind of just give an, uh, uh, a more 
graphical idea on uh, what a control may be. Um, and what's going to happen is all this, we are currently working on kind of a UI to put all this in. So the idea is all this information would be navigatable. So if you're interested in, you know, um, development, you could go in, you could click on this, go in, and then there'll be a list of projects, there'll be a list of examples. And, you know, one thing that we want to do in the future is also, for example, if we're talking about um, in the distribution phase, right, for artifacts and images, let's say you have um, signing trust and integrity. Uh, the idea is like, whenever you have signing trust and integrity on the, on the, um, the DevOps slash the distribution stage, you still want to also uh, be able to enforce that um, integrity at the runtime as well. So our plan is to have a linked um, content points. So for example, if you look at, um, you know, this is artifact integrity, there will be a link here that says, okay, uh, you may also want to check out the runtime section on this. So then you cover how do I sign the images, but at the same time you also cover uh, within uh, my orchestration system, how do I uh, verify these images when they're running? Um, oops. So um, what we are looking for right now is uh, content contributions. We have um, under the runtime section, uh, we do have a couple um, that are still kind of semi-filled or uh, not yet filled. So um, this is kind of like a, a plug to see if anyone in this group is interested in contributing to uh, any parts of this. Uh, that would be super helpful. Uh, especially I know like uh, the group here is a lot more familiar with the runtime projects than we are. <laughs> so this could be a good way to, to, to also introduce them into the ecosystem. Um, yeah, that's kind of all that I had to share. Um, I guess any questions, if not, I, I'm, this is pretty much all I have. What are some of the runtime sections uh, that, that, miss, that are missing some? Um, some initially we had our resource requests and limits, control plane authentication, um, secrets encryption. I think this was like three of the main ones. Um, I think these are, uh, and bootstrapping and the bootstrapping. So these are a few that are missing. Um, I would say the the main focus areas that we we are lacking uh, expertise is the uh, resource requests and limits, and the control plane authentication and secret encryption part of it. Um, but I, I would say you know whatever I think a lot of projects on the runtime side we don't have great visibility on. So you know if anyone. Um, can also just go through uh, the different projects in those sections and say, okay, maybe this additional project may be helpful here. That would also be, um, that will also be very good uh, for the document. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so um, one more question. So do you have a sample of some one of the one of those sections? Yeah. So that's that's. Uh, Let's pick one here. Let's pick runtime. I haven't reviewed the one there yet. So let's see. Um, so this is like service mesh. So just a bunch of service mesh projects. Uh, we also are kind of keeping track of a few um, commercial projects as well. So, so there's actually another uh, motivation of this is that we also want to look for gaps within the CNCF ecosystem. So part of this exercise is kind of seeing, okay, if there are there are certain areas where there are pro there are open source projects, uh, sorry, there are commercial projects, but there are no open source projects, then uh, we would try and make a recommendation to to the to the talk about you know maybe we should try and get some of these projects in or you know try and see whether we can create new projects around. Yeah. Uh, these areas. So I think uh, runtime is actually at the um, if you scroll down, yeah, there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is it this one? Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so this one is uh, like there's only one project, right? So maybe there are some that, that we may not be aware here. Um, yeah, maybe the eBPF stuff. I know there's a lot of stuff in the area. Uh, yeah, so it, it's not something that's like content heavy, it's pretty much, you know, here are this project, here are some examples, and then um, just to help help folks get a better idea on uh, how to secure certain aspects of, of the, the ecosystem. Got it, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, was the link to the doc published anywhere? Oh yeah, that, uh, I'm gonna. I'll put the the link to the issue and to the doc in the in the chat. Thank you. Once I can, once I can find the chat. Okay. All right. If not, uh, thanks, thanks Ricardo for for letting me come by and and share about this. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for coming by. Okay, so now we have Akihiro, and thank you for joining. Uh, Hi. Excited to have you uh, talk about the state of rootless. Answers. Yeah, so, uh, should I share my screen? Sure. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Hi, uh, so uh, let me uh, introduce uh, myself. Uh, I'm a software engineer at NTT, a telecom, a telecom company in Japan. And I'm a main engineer of uh, several projects, include, including RunC, Continuity, and Mobi, and also uh, several subs under dtab.com slash progress continuous. And today uh, I'll talk about uh, rootless containers, uh, which means running uh, container runtimes and also containers, of course, as a non root user on the host. Uh, just includes uh, running OCI runtimes, such as RunC, and CRI runtimes, such as Continuity and Cryo, and CNI plugins, uh, such as Runner, and also Kubernetes and Kube Proxy. Uh, so this is uh, useful for protecting the host from potential vulnerabilities and misconfigurations. Uh, so even in the worst case, the attacker can gain the normal user on the host, but the attacker cannot gain the root privileges. And the rootless containers are implemented using a kernel feature called user namespaces, uh, which allows mapping a non-root user to uh, something like a root user, but with Remit set of privileges. And in the Kubernetes, Kubernetes signal, uh, there's a similar uh, enhancement proposal about user namespace, uh, but the rootless containers is not related to this user namespace enhancement proposal and do not conflict either. Uh, so, uh, their user namespace proposal is about just running containers as a non-root non user, but they Runs the uh, runtimes as the root user. On the other hand, rootless containers run everything as a non-root user. So the no, so the rootless containers is uh, quite different from the user namespace proposal. And of course, uh, rootless containers is not the panacea, and there are some uh, drawbacks. Uh, for example, uh, the network throughput is. Uh, Slightly slow, uh, just like uh, 50 gigabps to uh, 10 gigabps. Uh, so this is this is uh, really slow, but uh, we are seeing huge improvements uh, in uh, these years. And rootless containers cannot support NFS and block storages, but uh, this is not a huge deal for Kubernetes because when you when you can use 
manage the databases and object storages such as Amazon S3. You don't need NFS and you don't need block storages. So I don't think that this is a serious problem. And uh, let me show the history of Rootless containers. Uh, it uh, started about 10 years ago by Alexi Fox, uh, but uh, this wasn't popular until uh, a few years ago. Uh, so in uh, 2018, uh, BuildKit started to support rootless mode. And we also had uh, Docker, Continuity, Portman, and Cryo, all of them supported rootless containers this year. And we also made patches for Kubernetes to support rootless mode, but the patches are not merged into the Kubernetes upstream at this moment. Uh, but uh, T3S already supported rootless mode in 2019. And this year, uh, we added a router support for kind uh, Kubernetes in Docker. Uh, so now uh, you can run Kubernetes in Rootless Docker and also Rootless Portman. And with regard to rule layers, uh, there, there's a lot of news. Uh, so uh, last year, uh, there was a new feature called SecComp at FD. And in this year, uh, we are seeing a uh, kernel mode overlay FS for rootless containers. And for sure, runtime spec is uh, be, being modified to support SecComp at FD. I will talk about this topic later. And uh, let me show uh, some examples of rootless containers, uh, such as uh, user entities. Utilities is our uh, reference distribution of Kubernetes for supporting rootless mode. And we have a demo uh, using a Docker Compose for uh, showing a virtual demo of Kubernetes cluster. I don't show demo today, but uh, I have uh, some screenshots in this screen. Uh, so if you run a Docker Compose up, uh, you will have a frontend based Kubernetes cluster, and these uh, components are running as a non-root user. And we support the both continuity and cryo as the CRI runtimes. And K3 is uh, also supporting, also support rootless mode using uh, the patches of user entities. The patches are not matched into the Kubernetes upstream, but K3 is uses forked version of Kubernetes. So it already supports rootless mode. And the case is uses Control D as the CRO runtime. And uh, just uh, last week, kind uh, Kubernetes in Docker uh, started to support rootless mode. And this will be included in kind version 0.11. And uh, kind uh, supports uh, Kubernetes without uh, patching, uh, but uh, for supporting uh, Kubernetes without patching, uh, we have uh, several uh, complicated hacks, such as uh, bind mounting dev nuru into slash proxies, sorry, uh, slash prox slash sys slash kernel to emulate uh, some uh, sys control values. And we also need to uh, some complicated configuration for cable proxy uh, to avoid uh, setting several privileged CCC values. Uh, but uh, we have uh, several complex hacks about uh, we can run Kubernetes without patching at all. And uh, this will be included in kind of version 0 0.11. Uh, so uh, within in a uh, few weeks, uh, you can try this easily. And the topic of this year is uh, SecComp. Uh, so just uh, two years ago, uh, kind of version 5.0 added a new kind of feature called SecComp user notification. Uh, this is a new way to emulate system calls in user space. This is uh, very similar to P2S, but uh, it's a uh, 
more lightweight, so it doesn't need context switches compared to the P2S. And this feature wasn't uh, supported by the OCR runtime spec, uh, but uh, just two days ago, uh, there was a pull request that was merged into OCR runtime spec. So OCR runtime spec uh, now supports uh, this same computer notification. Mm. Yeah. And uh, rootless containers will be able to use this second user notification uh, for emulating uh, sub URDs without a file called slash etc slash sub URD. Uh, so previously, you had to uh, have uh, this file. Uh, this file is um, something similar to slash etc slash password and slash etc slash group. And you had to uh, configure this file uh, for the rootless users. Uh, so this is. Uh, very difficult on up environments because uh, you have a uh, really bunch of users and you had to configure etc slash sub file. But uh, with second user notification, uh, you no longer need to prepare this slash etc slash sub file. And also uh, with uh, this second user notification, uh, we can completely remove uh, set URD binary files such as user slash bin slash new UID map. Uh, so this is uh, better in the uh, security. And kernel 5.9 added support for uh, SecComp IOCTL notif at FD. Uh, this is a new feature that allows injecting file distributors from a host process into container processes. Uh, so uh, we can uh, replace uh, the file descriptor of the socket on the connect syscall. Uh, so uh, we can remove the overhead of uh, user mode networking called SLURP. So uh, this is a uh, very uh, faster compared to previous users containers. And we have uh, some proof of concept code, but uh, not ready for production at this moment. So uh, there are uh, several tasks that, that, that uh, need uh, help from the community. Uh, so we need to have more experiments in the SIGCOMP. We also want to port over rootless kind to Minikube uh, with a Docker driver and a Portman driver. And we have a proposal for treatment signals but uh, this proposal is not merged yet. So uh, we need uh, some help to uh, facilitate acceptance of this proposal. And we, we have uh, some questions about rootless containers on uh, Stack Overflow and Reddit and also on several community sites. Uh, but uh, I don't have enough bandwidth to answer all of these uh, questions. Uh, so. Uh, it will be great uh, if uh, we can get help for the community to answer these questions. And uh, rootless containers components such as rootless kit and uh, container runtimes such as Rancy and container D and Mobi, uh, all of these components have uh, similar bugs. And uh, I don't have enough bandwidth to work on these bugs by myself. So. I'd like to have uh, some help from the community to resolve these bugs. And for uh, further information, uh, please visit uh, HTTPS constructors rootless contain dot RS. And uh, last year uh, in Cubicle, uh, we have uh, some presentation about rootless containers. And we also have a proposal to Kubernetes signals. That's all. Uh, do you have questions? I have a question uh, about the block storage support. Is it yeah. is it a completely no go, or is it something that um, the project owners are looking into? And is it is it just because like the mount is not uh, is not available, or what is why why you cannot use that? Uh, so uh, the kernel kind of maintainers uh, do not want to. Uh, support user namespaces for uh, 
X4 file system and uh, XF file system. And uh, so uh, several uh, file system drivers are, are likely to have uh, bugs and they don't want to expose uh, these uh, potential bugs to non-root user. Uh, so the kind of maintenance do, do not want to have rooters support for uh, X4 and XFS and other uh, protocol ready file systems. Uh, so we cannot uh, support a block services. But uh, uh, we could uh, have uh, fuse a file system in user space for uh, implementing X4 and XFS in the user space. Uh, so the potentially uh, we can support have block services, but uh, we are likely to have a uh, significant performance overhead because file system in user space is slow. Yeah, but we, we can uh, support block services uh, if uh, we want to do. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Uh, I have a few actually, but one is: uh, Is there any any update on on a kernel support of overlay FS from a user namespaces? Uh, I know that they've talked about that for a long time, but is there? I know there's fuse overlay FS, but is there? So there you go. The kernel mode overlay FS. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, there's uh, two implementation of overlay FS in the. Uh, Kernel mode and the, in the user space, like uh, fuse over FS. Uh, but kernel mode over the FS uh, didn't support uh, rootless until uh, kernel 5.11. Uh, but uh, 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 so it so, is already uh, in 5.11? Uh, yeah, 5.11. Uh, it's uh, released uh, last month, I think. Ah, OK. I hadn't heard that. So that could be a good a good improvement in performance, hopefully over fuse over LFS. Yeah. Um, another one is um, I run into lots of problems with getting the PID namespaces. Um, hmm. Docker and Kubernetes block them by default. They put in they mask them by mounting other uh, masking by mounting other. Uh, file other things on top of slash proc so that you can't mount a new slash proc in an unprivileged user namespace. So have, have, do you have any any insight into that? Um, I presume the, the rootless ones have don't block those things like Docker and Kubernetes do. Uh, sorry, uh, you said uh, slash proc slash what? Slash proc for an unprivileged slash proc. So if you have a new PID namespace, and an unprivileged user namespace, right? Um, so you can't, so in order to make a new PID namespace, which, you know, any Docker container has its own PID namespace. Yeah. Um, and you need this for any time. So, so, but, but you can't run within Docker. You can't create another P, uh, unprivileged PID namespace because they block slash proc. Uh, you can't, unless you run with, you know, uh, the, um, Unmasked, uh, uh, it's called uh, this is security. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, you need to uh, bind mount uh, slash proc file system. And right. uh, Rootless port mount already supports uh, uh, dash dash PID uh, with uh, such bind mount. Um, what, what, which does it, did you say? You mean a bind mounted from outside the slash proc? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, bind mount slash proc into the container. Yeah, but if but that you can do, but if you, but you want to have its own PID namespace inside of a container, then you need a, a new slash proc. Uh, you need to have an unprivileged PID namespace. So I'm talking about a separate, be able to isolate two different containers. Hmm. Uh, so uh, so uh, in that PID case, namespace. So in that case, uh, if uh, you have uh, mount namespace along with a uh, PID namespace, uh, you can just mount uh, proc FS. And all of the uh, rootless containers, uh, including Docker and Postman, uh, supports PID namespace in that way. Hmm. Uh, so um, if uh, you have uh, some uh, problem, uh, maybe uh, you can uh, post the Configure JSON of OCR runtime uh, to uh, 
the data which is of run CD for for uh, maybe some some years. Uh, so maybe uh, I can look, look into that to help the problem. So I mean, Docker is relatively easy because they have this option: security uh, system pass equals unconfined. So that if you're just running inside Docker, you can run this, and it will allow you to mount a slash proc. Kubernetes, we have a regular KAS has been. We haven't actually figured out how to and how to enable the, the the corresponding option. Was supposed to be a way to do it with uh, proc mount uh, unmasked, but we haven't got it to work. Uh, and and uh, I, I presume the like K3S and stuff that don't block these don't don't have this by default to blocking the mount of, of a new slash proc. Mm -hmm. So okay, so you're not you probably haven't run into this when you don't use Kubernetes anymore. You have all these other variations of not K8S the the the, the, the you know, use K3S probably or whatever else uh, kind. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess uh, we need to have have uh, work in the kernel to uh, uh, to to facilitate the amount of proc files without uh, such a such a dash dash security opt. Yeah. So I think uh, we need to have some work in the kernel. Mm -hmm. Now this is this is this is a beyond kernel problem because the kernel allows it, but the problem is that these container systems are blocking other things inside the container from using it. So because because they are doing they are putting they are deliberately putting in other things on top of slash proc so you can't um, so uh, th that that to prevent it so that by default Docker will will uh, make those confined of, of slash proc and uh, and so does Kubernetes and Kubernetes makes it even harder to to do that. Uh, loud proc mount types yeah. is the is the option inside the pod security policy, and we haven't got it to work. So, Dave, if I may ask, what, what are you trying to do at a high level? What what is the overall goal um, that you're trying to accomplish within the container? We'd like we'd like to be able to run a completely unprivileged um, uh, container within a Kubernetes pod. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And. Uh, in particular, we use singularity unprivileged and with the dash dash PID option so that you can create a, a, a separate PID namespace. So, so I put a link there to a, to a runtime that may help you. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the lead developer of a runtime called Sysbox that allows you to create a rootless boss inside of which you can run things like Docker and systemd and microservices and stuff like that. And it will probably solve the problem that I think you're trying to, to get at. If you run Kubernetes inside of this. No, or oh, you can you can deploy the pod with Kubernetes and that. I'm, I, mean, ah, I see, so you run Docker, you use. It's, it's like a new run C. Okay, so that's a replacement for run C. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll take a look. Hey, Akihiro, if I, may, if, I am, if I may ask, my name is Cesar, and I am, the, as I mentioned, the developer in, of a new runtime called Sysbox and you run C. And number one, I wanted to introduce myself and thank you so much for all the work that you've done on rootless containers on, on all the many years. You know, it's a lot of perseverance from your part to overcome very challenging technical feats, you know, in the kernel. So we really appreciate that. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, you um, just at a high level, when you talk about rootless containers, I almost feel like the term rootless containers is a, it's not entirely accurate to what you are actually doing. I think what you're trying to do is a rootless runtime, you know, because the rootless container itself, right, uh, is sort of a subset of that, right? A rootless runtime generates a rootless container. But mm. the reason I mention it is because, for example, in the Kubernetes KEP, you know, that you mentioned right there, yeah. There's going to be the notion of a rootless pod, but Kubernetes itself is running, you know, rootful, right? In order to do whatever it needs to do. And so I can sense already, you know, a bit of confusion there, right? And where people say rootless containers, does that mean that Kubernetes is running rootless or does it mean the pods are running rootless? And there are two different things. In, it seems to me in your case, you're really targeting a very challenging problem, which is a rootless runtime, right? You know, which has a lot of merit. 
but it is not quite the same as the rootless container itself uh, because the runtime can be rootful, but the container can be rootless. And, and, and you know, so there's, uh, what do you think about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, makes sense, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, rootless container is it's, uh, not, not something uh, I invented. Uh, so there was already uh, rootless containers uh, when, when I, I became interested in, yeah, so. Uh, Actually, uh, it, it's uh, difficult to uh, rename uh, rootless containers. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I agree that rootless yeah. runtimes. Even the name rootless is already kind of weird because you are root inside of the container or inside the pod, but you're not root at the host. So there's also that. <laughs> there's a whole thing, you know. But um, yeah, just so I would mention it. Um, um, mm. In our case, for example, with the runtime that we develop, all the containers we generate are rootless meaning yeah. they are in the Linux user namespace, right? And we mm -hmm. do things like virtualizing PROCFS, virtualizing SysFS, Cisco trapping, you know, special mounts, ShiftFS, you know, we're doing all sorts of advanced things to enable these rootless containers to run things like Docker, SystemD, and microservices and all that stuff. But it is just rootless containers. Our runtime itself needs root because it needs to do very advanced things like Cisco trapping and things like that that are really hard to do rootless you know um so we're i i think of ourselves as rootless container but we are not a rootless runtime you know and i think mm -hmm. a lot of what you're mentioning here is a rootless runtime which is an even more challenging thing than what we're <laughs> that what we're up to if i, if I may ask mm. yeah. um, sounds like the victim of um scope creep yeah <laughs> so i love rootless containers and now rootless run Say, say that again. Sorry, I didn't catch that. So, so, no, it's a, it's a, it's a bad job. I, I was saying it's probably maybe it's scope creep. You know, they want to do with those containers, and then they're like, yeah. why don't we make yeah. it the runtime as well? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I had a question after here actually about mm -hmm. the the setcom stuff we talked about. Um, uh, the the user notifications. You said that it has better performance in Petrace. You know. Um, do you have any details about, um, you know, we were looking at this last time with Nabla, right? We, we looked at S-Trace. Um, is this supposedly better than, than, than S-Trace as well? Do you have any experiments that, or any numbers that, that you could kind of share? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, for p uh, you have to, uh, sub, you have to uh, uh, inject hooks for every syscalls. Uh, even for uh, syscalls, uh, you are not interested in. Uh, but uh, with second presentation, uh, you can only uh, inject hooks into the uh, interesting system calls. Uh, so the number of context switches uh, is proportional to the uh, number of syscalls uh, you want to uh, emulate in the user, user space. Okay, but, but do, you, the, do you still get like the, the overhead of like having to to, to go back between kernel space and user space, right? But I guess that's not as big as, as that, that's not as bad. Uh, mm. uh, I don't uh, have uh, uh, benchmark data, yeah. Yeah. You, you I said so you I, want, I, sorry, uh, I just, just wanted to ask, you, you said you wanted to get more experiments on SACOM. Um, uh, yeah. What kind of experiments are you looking for? Uh, yeah, uh, it it will be great uh, if uh, we can uh, get uh, some experiments in uh, the overhead of uh, this sequence piece of Yeah. Okay, so so you're looking for performance performance uh, data. Okay. Uh, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we, we if I may add, we um, in the simple runtime we use this mechanism quite a bit to intercept certain system calls. It is very useful. And uh, because we can select the specific system calls that we want to intercept, for example, we intercept the mount system call, because it's very important that whenever progfs or sysfs are mounted inside of one of these rootless containers, it is our emulated progfs and sysfs that get mounted, not the kernels progfs. Otherwise, you create a security hole. So we use that second user, user notification mechanism, and it has, also has the advantage that you can just decide when to process a particular system call. And if the arguments are not ones that you need to process, you can send it back to the kernel so that the kernel can do the, the regular processing of the system call. So it doesn't, like the mount, for example, system call is a very complex system call to, mm -hmm. to, to emulate, right? So we only 
emulated in certain scenarios. In the cases we don't we don't care about it, we send it back to the kernel, and then the kernel continues with the uh, with the processing. Right. Uh, I do think that it does add a bit of overhead, so we only use it in control path operations. We shy away from using it in any sort of data path operations. Um, and, and how much overhead? It depends how much. What are, what are you doing there, right, with that particular system call in, in user space? You know, mm. but it's a very powerful mechanism. Um, yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, for uh, emulating uh, sub URGs, uh, we, we have to uh, emulate uh, a lot of system calls, such as uh, CHO Owen and uh, set UID and several system calls. Yeah, uh, so th these are very yeah, uh, com complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking of doing as far as a set comp like a hero for ETC? Um, uh, for emulating sub UIDs without the ETC sub UID file, what what exactly does that does does that mean? What what sort of syscalls would you be intercepting, for example, via user second? Uh, uh, so, uh, without a sub UID file, uh, we, we can't uh, uh, emulate uh, multiple users for rootless containers. Uh, but uh, with second user notification, uh, we can. Emulate uh, syscalls uh, such as uh, set UID uh, to uh, just uh, uh, no no operation uh, but uh, uh, modify uh, the several syscalls such as get UID to uh, return a fake value, and we can also uh, inject hooks into CH own uh, to uh, fix ownership of the file. File permissions. Okay, got it. Thanks. Oh, in fact, go ahead. I had, I had one here. Actually, this was also the initial trigger for this, but in your help wanted slides uh, at the here, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's kind of amazing the amount of work you've done. Uh, tracking this in all these different projects, so it's it's in, it's insane. Uh, but, but my question would be like, what's the best way to help you out? Because um, I don't know if you need some help uh, from the end users to to like try this out, or but it's it's not very clear to me how to 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 report this. Would it would it help to have like a some place where we can coordinate all these uh, things you're doing in different components and maybe report uh, user experience. What do you think? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think uh, it would be great uh, if uh, the community can have uh, more tweets and blog articles and uh, and answering questions on uh, Stack Overflow and Reddit and uh, other community sites uh, that really would be uh, very helpful for to the end users of risk containers. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering, I don't know, maybe Ricardo can say, I don't, I don't know where it would fit. And if there's one place where you could have like a working group dedicated to this, where we can track all the points, so all the work, uh, all the components that have support what's missing because I guess it's in your head but uh, I'm wondering if it's uh, if it's worth uh, creating something somewhere for this just dedicated to rootless support uh, so uh, we have our uh, HTTPS construct rush rootless contain dot to okay. uh, 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 answer your question I will check it out yeah maybe <laughs> yeah. so no I think I think uh, I'm interjecting here, but I think it, what Ricardo was talking about is, um, you know, maybe from the CNC of how uh, the community can organize around it, right? So, and into one way, the the uh, six and the the TOC have of uh, organizing the community is by creating uh, work groups uh, under some of these six. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there will be. Um, uh, somebody who drives that, like, uh, I mean, it could be you if you're interested, right, Akihira, uh, oh. 
it could be the the chair or the or the lead of that community, and and basically gather the people around so that you get more contrib contributors, right? And and then also you get the support from from the CNCF. Oh, thanks. That's, 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 that sounds interesting. That's yeah. So so yeah, if you if if you think that's a good way to go, you know, uh, the CNCF will be happy to be there to to help you out and. You know, Ricardo is also in the TOC, so it, uh, yeah, I, th I think maybe, maybe if you're interested, okay, I think we can come up with something uh, to, to give more visibility to this effort. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so it's a religious continuous. Uh, we, we have uh, several people, uh, such as Alex Sarai from Susie and, and Giuseppe Scriban from Retard. Uh, so maybe. I, I will ask uh, these guys too about the uh, SIGO group, yeah. That sounds great, yeah. 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 Sounds good, thanks. thanks. One more thing I, I wanted to point out is um, I'm, I'm submitting a change to your singularity page on, on rootless containers because um, there you're, you're talking about the set uid mode and fake root mode of singularity yeah. um, but there's actually that's not the main either of those well let's say there there is another there's a third mode which oh. is more the default when you're running unprivileged you can you can run unprivileged singularity without fake root the default mode is to just use what's called unprivileged user namespace mode it just it has no root at all inside the the container that's actually more rootless than what you guys are talking about because oh. there's no root there's no root user at all inside the container it's only the original user the same one inside and outside right so it, it can be completely unprivileged and it doesn't need any help or uh you know new uid map uh tool or anything like that because it just has no root so that's um, oh. that's not useful in some cases but it's it's useful in a lot of cases too if we're just we're trying to isolate we have have an unprivileged user that runs other other users payloads so this is going to be very useful for that because we don't care if they don't have any access to root we just want them to so that's just uh it's not nearly a, as a uh, complete a container system but it but it's still very useful so. oh sounds interesting yeah yeah so i think uh, i need to modify uh I really just want to page about uh, singularity. Yeah, I, I will yeah, try I'll, to. I'll send you a pull request for that. I, oh, yeah, thanks. That's great. So, Akihiro, if I may ask, where, where, what is your vision sort of where, where rootless containers, I mean, the project, the, pro, the project that you're working on, what is your vision for it? Where, you know, when would you say, okay, I'm happy that we've reached the state where, you know, I accomplished everything that I wanted to accomplish for for this project, right? Um, um, yeah, where would where do you see this? Like, let's say five years from now, if you if you had your way. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, you said uh, what, what what is what is where do you where what is your vision for the project? Where do you see it going? Uh, let's say in five years, right? Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in, in five years. Uh, I think uh, most uh, Drupal users and Portman users uh, will use uh, rootless contents by default. Mm. I think it's highly likely for uh, local containers on laptop, yeah, but uh, for promoting rootless containers to uh, production clusters, uh, especially Kubernetes clusters, uh, we will need uh, some help from uh, cloud providers such as uh, GKE or EKS or AKS. Yeah, so uh, if uh, we can get help from uh, these uh, Kubernetes service providers, uh, we'll be able to promote uh, rootless containers into the uh, production clusters uh, within five years, yeah. And by that, you mean the whole Kubernetes runtime itself running rootless, right? The uh, yeah. whole the user uh, yeah. right? The user natives approach. Uh, it, it, that's what. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so uh, in ideal world, uh, uh, so 
GKE and EKS and uh, ATS, uh, we'll have a checkbox on their uh, web user interface and uh, click here to run a uh, Kubernetes and container D as a, a non root user. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, th that's uh, uh, my dream within uh, five years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I don't work for Google, I don't work for Amazon or, or uh, Microsoft. So, so sure. uh, obviously, uh, that needs help from the uh, industry. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and the goal there being to protect the host from vulnerabilities in the kubelet, for example, itself, right? Uh, or, yeah. in, or in the underlying runtime. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's uh, the main motivation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, aside from that, uh, uh, HPC users, uh, high performance computing users, uh, uh, we uh, want to uh, use rootless for uh, uh, some kind of uh, multi transparency in a shared cluster. And, and, and just a general question for anyone that, that wants to answer is I mean, in your experience, um, do people care more about securing the runtime itself, or do they care more about securing the container itself, right? Uh, you know, because as I was mentioning, uh, the uh, Kubernetes KDP uh, that with user namespaces would secure the pod itself, but not the kubelet, right? The kubelet will continue to run root, but the pod itself is now rootless, right? Uh, I'm wondering, you know, uh, obviously if people could have both, they'll probably have both, but I'm wondering at this stage of things where, where is more of the demand of? Is it more on protecting the runtimes or just protecting the container? The container isolation boundary itself. Yeah, uh, so I think uh, the bo both uh, points are really important, and, and so and uh, the rootless mode and the user name space it has its proposal uh, do not conflict either. Uh, so uh, we can just uh, serve them together uh, by uh, nesting user name space inside uh, rootless containers. Yeah. Uh, so um, yeah. So ideally, uh, we run uh, runtimes as a uh, non-root user such as UID uh, 1000 and also uh, run ports uh, with uh, different UID such as uh, 2000 and 2001 and such as, uh, so uh, uh, yeah. I see, I see. So you feel that it would be first rootless pods initially, just the pods, right? The kubelet will continue to run rootful, but then eventually as you continue to work in enabling user nadies and, and running the kubelet, let's say rootless, at some point they could interact together, right? In the sense that you have the kubelet rootless and then inside of that, you could in, even nest a, a user namespace inside for the pods themselves. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, if I may add that the production environments would like to have something less uh, privileged at, uh, at the lowest level. Uh, so it, I think uh, the rootless runtimes hasn't been a pretty necessarily available in all places or or hasn't been available at all, right? So so what uh, you know some people have been doing is just trying to secure the pod or secure the container, right? So more at the more at the nest level. Uh, so yeah, if you if you are able to break out of the container and if, in if you are running something as root, uh, the kubelet or the the runtime, then an attacker could actually gain access to the host. So I, I mean, I think this uh, the the largest uh, or the biggest concern is 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 to um, is that somebody could gain access to to that host and, and cause some damage, right? So, and that's what. Um, People have been talking about with multi-tenancy and also, you know, there are some of the other runtimes like um, Kata containers that run the container in the VM. So it's, it's it's actually preventing that access to the host. Uh, so uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, what's, what's, what's what was uh, your question? No, it, it wasn't necessarily a question. It was more of a comment. Uh. Yeah, yeah. So that uh, it's more like an opinion, right? The, the, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so uh, actually, uh, Kata containers uh, provides uh, more, more stronger isolation. Yeah, but uh, Kata containers require uh, uh, 
CPU support for virtualization, uh, such as Intel PTX. And uh, this uh, virtualization is uh, not available on typical uh, cloud instances. Uh, so it's available on uh, Azure and also Google Computing Engine, and, but uh, necessary virtualization on uh, these clouds are really slow. And uh, AWS doesn't support necessary virtualization at all. Uh, so, but uh, AWS provides uh, bare metal instances, uh, so uh, you can run kata continuous inside a uh, bare metal instance of EC2, uh, but bare metal instances are uh, really expensive. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so uh, running kata continuous uh, on, on, on premise is, is uh, really attractive, but uh, running kata continuous on uh, cr cloud is uh, somewhat uh, difficult. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things that when we were developing Cisco, we wanted to create a rootless container capable of running same workloads as VMs because we wanted to avoid the VM basically, right? And so, but to your point, Ricardo, I mean, we're using things like second notification, what you do that Cisco trapping and, and advanced techniques like that. And I just don't know how, I don't see us going, making the runtime rootless because we do have to be root in order to be doing things like Cisco trapping from other processes, right? So. Um, for us, at least short term, we don't have rootless running the runtime that we created rootless in the short term because we're just doing things that require really true root uh, source permissions, like Cisco trapping is just one example. Um, uh, not, having said that, you know, uh, if we could run rootless, that would be great also, right? Because, you know, then we could secure ourselves too, right? Uh, you know, but our focus has been more on the container itself. Uh, yes, but I think it's very challenging. I think uh, the work that Hacker Hero has been doing all of the last oh, years is okay. securing the runtimes shows how challenging it is really to secure the run. And it's getting more challenging because things like eVPF and, <laughs> and second notified, a lot of the kernel power is going to move into user space, but that requires some sort of high right. privilege <laughs> in order yeah. to use that, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's kind of like a chicken and egg type of problem, right? So I think it's like, yeah, yeah you you want to allow, you know, uh, oh, you want to have less privilege, but then to have that less privilege, maybe you need to have some sort of privilege. Right. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, yeah. It's it's an interesting topic. I think it it, it because. Uh, you know, people have talked about over the years on how to be more secure and allow, you know, less and less and within containers. And but then in the end, it's it's a matter of what um, what's m the most important for particular users, right? So like, um, um, there there's there's got to be some compromises, right? So if you if you are, for example, you know preventing people from using root, but then you need to allow something, you know, so. I think part of it is also like just granularity. Um, a lot of this, the, the capabilities uh, have kind of scaled down from a big umbrella over a couple of years. So that helps. And I think just like, you know, having parts of the code they're using which are privileged be measured and and attestable i think that that is kind of like will solve um half of the problem as well hmm. so before we run out of time akihiro if you need any help i mean we we're not the, the work that we're doing is not exactly the same that what, what you're doing right because you're securing the runtimes and we're just securing the container but there is an overlap Right, there's an overlap, certainly. So we'll be happy to help you in that area of overlap right there, right? And the overlap it revolves around the rootless container itself, right? And the things that can run in the rootless container itself, right? That's the area of overlap. And so, you know, we'll be happy uh, to help in, in, in that area uh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, thanks. All right, so I think it's uh, nine o'clock. Uh, well, Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you Akihiro for the presentation. Thank you Brandon for the presentation. Uh, yeah, and uh, if you uh, want to keep the conversation going, I mean, we have a Slack channel, so we can also have any conversation there, any follow-ups. Uh, um, 
any questions or uh, anything related to the work that Aki Hero is doing or Sysbox is doing. Uh, and yeah, and, or, and also Six Security. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. <clears throat>